I want to talk about a specific event that will take place in America's very near future, which could actually bring our country and our way of life to a grinding halt. This looming crisis is related to the financial crisis of 2008, but it is infinitely more dangerous, as I'll explain in this video. As this problem comes to a head, I expect there to be riots in the streets, arrests on an unprecedented scale, and martial law enforced by the U.S. military. Believe me, I don't make this prediction lightly, and I have no interest in trying to scare you. I'm simply following my research to its logical conclusion. The same financial problems I've been tracking from bank to bank, from company to company, for the last five years have now found their way into the U.S. Treasury. You see, I can tell you with near 100% certainty that most Americans will not know what to do when commodity prices, things like milk, bread, and gasoline, soar. They won't know what to do when banks close and their credit cards stop working, or when they're not allowed to buy gold or foreign currencies, or when food stamps fail. In short, our way of life in America is about to change, I promise you. In this video, I'll show you exactly what's happening. You can challenge every single one of my facts, and you'll find that I'm right about each allegation I make, and then you can decide for yourself. Will you act now to protect yourself and your family from the catastrophe that's brewing right now in Washington, D.C.? I hope so. That's why I made this video. In short, I believe that we as Americans are about to see a major, major collapse in our national monetary system and our normal way of life. Basically, for many years now, our government has been borrowing so much money, very often using short-term loans, that very soon we will no longer be able to afford even the interest on these loans. Again, I say these things as an expert in accounting and financial research. You may not think things are that bad in the U.S. economy, but consider this simple fact from the National Inflation Association. Even if all U.S. citizens were taxed at 100% of their income, it would still not be enough to balance the federal budget. We'd still have to borrow money just to maintain the status quo. For example, when Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac collapsed in the summer of 2008, the U.S. government responded by simply guaranteeing all of their outstanding debt. Since then, these companies have recorded hundreds of billions of losses, all of which were passed along to the government. Yes, you can still get mortgages today. And yes, Freddie and Fannie are still in business. But the costs associated with these programs are piling up at the U.S. Treasury, and they are enormously expensive. These losses and trillions in other private obligations are now the responsibility of the U.S. government. The problem is, even before this crisis, our government was deeply in debt. With each additional commitment, we sink further and further into debt, closing in upon the moment that we can simply no longer afford even the interest payments on our obligations. According to even my most conservative calculations, using numbers provided by the Congressional Budget Office, a debt default by the U.S. government would be inevitable were it not for one simple anomaly, the one thing that has saved the United States so far. I'm talking about our country's unique ability to simply print more money. You see, the U.S. government has one very important weapon to use in this crisis. The U.S. is the only debtor in the world who can legally print U.S. dollars. And the U.S. dollar is known as the world's reserve currency. The dollar forms the basis of the world's financial system. It is what banks around the world hold in reserve against their loans. That's a secret that most politicians don't understand. As things stand now, the U.S. government can't go broke in any ordinary sense of the word because it can simply print dollars to pay for its bad debts. That's what it's been doing since March of 2009. That might sound pretty good at first. Since we can always just print more money, what's there to worry about? Well, let me show you. You see, as things stand today, America is the only country in the world that doesn't have to pay for its imports in a foreign currency. Let's say you're a German and you want to buy oil from Saudi Arabia. You can't just pay for your oil in German marks or the new euro currency because oil is priced in U.S. dollars. So, 
you have to buy dollars first, then you buy your oil. And that means the value of the German currency is of great importance to the German government. To maintain the value of its currency, Germans must produce at least as much as they consume from around the world. Otherwise, the value of its currency will begin to fall, causing prices to rise and its standard of living to decline. But in America, we can consume as much as we want without worrying about acquiring the money to pay for it because our dollars are accepted everywhere around the world. In short, for decades now, we haven't had to produce anything or export anything to get all the dollars we needed to buy all the oil and other goods our country required. All we had to do was borrow the money. And boy, did we. Take a look at this chart. Even as late as the 1970s, America was the world's largest creditor. But by the mid-1980s, we'd become a debtor to the world. And since the late 1990s, we've been the world's largest debtor. Today, our government owes more money to more people than anyone else in the world. And that was before the financial crisis. In short, with all of these bad debts piling up, we've had to begin repaying our debts by printing trillions of new dollars. The impact of this is only just now beginning to be felt. Once our creditors figure out what's happening, they're going to be very angry. I believe they will either completely stop accepting dollars in repayment or greatly discount the value of these new dollars. I'm sure you think that sounds crazy, but as I'll show you, it's already happening. And that will make our consumption-led way of life impossible to afford. Just think about the price of oil. Access to cheap oil has been America's number one gift of owning the world's reserve currency. This, along with several other government policies, has made gas cheaper in the U.S. than almost anywhere else in the developed world. I know you may think gas prices have skyrocketed in recent years, but look at how much less we pay than other developed nations. According to a recent study by Kiplinger's Personal Finance, we pay around $3.61 a gallon on average here in the U.S., but in Canada, it's $5.56. The French pay a whopping $8.21. The Japanese pay $6.62. Australians pay $5.41, and the Chinese pay $4.54. And here's the thing. If oil is no longer priced in dollars, the price of oil for Americans will skyrocket immediately. It will change our lives overnight. Airline travel will get much more expensive. The cost to ship goods by truck to grocery stores around the country will get much more expensive. Farming itself will get a lot more costly. So will commuting to work, taking a taxi. Just about everything we do will suddenly get much more expensive. And remember, in order for prices to start skyrocketing, all that has to happen is that other countries start preferring payments in something besides U.S. dollars. The U.S. dollar has been the world's reserve currency for decades now, so most Americans don't have a clue about what the repercussions are of losing this status. You might think this could never happen, but it happens all the time when countries get too far in debt or when they consume too much or produce too little. In fact, the same thing happened to Great Britain in the 1970s. Most people don't know this, but British sterling was the reserve currency for most of the world for nearly 200 years, for most of the 18th and 19th centuries. It continued to play this role until after World War II, when America was forced to prop up Britain's economy with foreign aid. Remember the famous Marshall Plan, when we gave billions to help European countries rebuild? Unfortunately, though, Britain pursued a socialist national agenda. The government took over all of the major industries, like Barack Obama. Britain's leaders wanted to, quote, spread the wealth around. Pretty soon, the country was flat broke. The final straw for Britain came in 1967, when things got so bad, the Labour Party, which is the socialists, decided to devalue the British currency by 14% overnight. They believed this would make it easier for people to afford their debts. In reality, all it did was make anyone holding British sterling 14% poorer overnight. It made everything in Britain much, 
much more expensive in the coming years. For the country as a whole, it ushered in one of the worst decades in modern British history. Most Americans don't know anything about Britain's winter of discontent in the late 1970s when the government put a freeze on wages. There were continuous strikes in nearly every sector, grave diggers, trash collectors, even hospital workers. Things got so bad at one point that many hospitals were reduced to accepting emergency patients only. In 1975, inflation in Britain skyrocketed to 26.9 percent in a single year. The government also imposed what was known as the three-day week in 1974. In short, businesses were limited to using electricity for only three specified consecutive days each week, and they were prohibited from working longer hours on those days. Television companies were required to cease broadcasting at 10.30 p.m. to save electricity. Imagine, Britain was a global superpower for 150 years, but when they started intentionally devaluing their currency, things went straight downhill. Maybe you don't think something similar can happen here, but I'm telling you, it's already underway. In fact, the exchange value of the U.S. dollar has plummeted in the past year. Look at this chart. From June 1st of 2010 to June 1st of this year, the U.S. dollar has plunged 12 percent. That's a huge move in the currency world. In short, people are quickly losing faith in the U.S. dollar. What happened to the British currency is now happening to the U.S. dollar. Not only will the price of gas, oil, and other commodities skyrocket in America, almost everything we consume will immediately get more expensive. All the clothing, furniture, and household goods we import from China, all the food we get from Central and South America, all the electronics, television, computers, and cars we get from Asia and Europe. In fact, it's happening right now before our eyes. The price of gold is up more than 100 percent since the financial crisis of 2009. Oil prices have doubled. Soybeans are way up. Copper prices are up more than 170 percent since 2009. Cotton prices are up 80 percent in just the past year. As Wesley Card, the head of a clothing company that includes brands like Dockers and Ann Klein, was quoted by the New York Times, it's really a no-choice situation. Prices have to come up. This chart shows how much a few key commodities have skyrocketed in price just since the beginning of 2009. Of course, skyrocketing commodity prices are just the beginning. There are other disastrous consequences to the U.S. dollar losing status as the world's reserve currency. For example, there would be much less demand for U.S. dollars around the globe, so interest rates will skyrocket. Instead of getting a mortgage at today's incredibly low rates of 4.5%, it might cost you 8% or even 10% or 15%. Imagine what that would do to housing prices. Stock prices would likely plummet by at least 40% in a matter of weeks as a result of this event in the currency markets. It will cost every American business a lot more money for supplies and materials. No one will be able to get a loan and no bank will want to make loans. In short, when the U.S. dollar loses its spot as the world's reserve currency, it will cause a brutal downturn in the economy, which I expect will be about 10 times worse than the mortgage crisis of 2008. You see, what will also happen as a result of this currency crisis and the end of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency will be massive inflation, the likes of which we've never seen before. When everyone is trying to get rid of their dollars, the government is printing more and more to pay debts, and no one wants to own them, the crisis will reach epic proportions. It's all coming to a head soon, much sooner than people think. Remember, too, that in roughly the past 100 years, this type of debt crisis has reared its ugly head in Germany, Russia, Austria, Poland, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, the Ukraine, Japan, and China. I believe it will soon happen right here in the United States. Don't believe me? Well, the truth is that it's already happening at the local and state levels. Take a look. According to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, a Washington, D.C.-based think tank, at least 46 states face huge budget shortfalls for 2011. The Center reports that the total state budget shortfall could reach $160 billion in 2011. And although many states got federal help over the past year, that aid is now gone. The CBS News program, 60 Minutes, 
ran a story on this crisis in recent weeks and reported that, quote, there is a financial crisis looming involving state and local governments. The states have collectively spent nearly half a trillion dollars more than they collected in taxes. There is also a trillion dollar hole in their public pension funds. So, what are these desperate governments trying to do? You won't believe their proposals. The state of Arizona, for example, announced in early 2010 that it is selling $735 million worth of government-owned buildings, but will still occupy them by paying a 20-year lease. The government is selling the legislative buildings, the House, the Senate, the State Capitol Executive Tower, the State Fairgrounds, even prisons. In California, the state has taken the radical step of opening its prison doors and releasing thousands of inmates. About 11% of the state budget goes to the penal system. That's more than they spend on higher education. So California is slashing the number of inmates by 6,500 people next year. In other words, they're cutting loose about 4% of the prison population. Incredibly, other states, including New York, may do the same thing. In Georgia, the government is proposing taking out dead peasant policies on state employees. When these folks die, the money won't go to the dead person's family, but to the state's coffers to help pay for more programs, insurance, and pension liabilities. It's simply incredible, isn't it? State and municipal governments are so broke and so desperate that they are taking unprecedented steps to at least temporarily avoid bankruptcy. Nearly every state in the union is talking about legalizing some form of gambling to boost tax revenue. California still wants to legalize marijuana, even though it was defeated in the recent election. Of course, none of these ridiculous steps will work in the long run. And the truly amazing thing is that the U.S. federal government is in even worse shape than the local governments. The only reason we haven't seen the full brunt of this crisis yet on the federal level is because we've just continued to pile on more and more debt. The states can't print money, but the federal government can, at least for now. And for the moment, this is all that is preventing a currency collapse of unprecedented proportions. This is the important point. What most people don't realize is that the U.S. government can only continue printing dollars as long as the U.S. dollar remains the world's reserve currency. In other words, this is all going to fall apart much sooner than people think. In fact, it's already happening. The first steps are already well underway. It's happening right now before our very eyes. I can't stress this enough. You need to act now in order to protect your assets and grow your savings in the next few years. In the next few minutes, I'm going to show you exactly how I'm protecting my own money and what I recommend doing with yours. But first, let me show you exactly what's going on right now. Like I said, most Americans don't believe the U.S. dollar could ever lose its spot as the world's reserve currency. But I'm here to tell you, this process is already well underway. For example, although it went almost completely unreported in the U.S. press, last fall, a group of the world's most powerful countries, including China, Japan, Russia, and France got together for a secret meeting without the United States being present or even knowing about the meeting. Veteran Middle East reporter Robert Fisk reported on this event in Britain's independent newspaper. In the most profound financial change in recent Middle East history, Gulf Arabs are planning, along with China, Russia, Japan, and France, to end dollar dealings for oil, moving instead to a basket of currencies, including the Japanese yen, Chinese yuan, the euro, gold, and a new unified currency planned for the nations in the Gulf Cooperation Council, including Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, and Qatar. Fisk also interviewed a Chinese banker who said this. These plans will change the face of international financial transactions. America and Britain must be very worried. You will know how worried by the thunder of denials this news will generate. And sure enough, after Fisk published the details of this secret meeting, U.S. officials and central bankers from around the globe denied these plans. But as the old central banking adage goes, how do you know exactly when a currency will be devalued? The answer? Right after the head of the central bank goes on television to adamantly deny any such transaction will occur. 
And guess who just went public in recent weeks with a statement about how the U.S. will not devalue its currency? You guessed it, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, Tim Geithner. You see, the last thing a central banker wants to do in the midst of a devaluation is to give people a warning before he can devalue. So they have to deny, deny, deny. After the announcement is made, it's too late for citizens and investors to get out. Like I said, what's incredible is that this story of a secret meeting among most of the major powers besides the U.S. was greatly underreported in the American press. But you know what? The way I see it, it's much more telling to look at actions rather than government press releases. For example, here is what is happening right now in the real world. When you read these facts, I think you'll agree with me that the U.S. dollar's days are numbered as far as remaining the world's reserve currency. China is getting out of the dollar. Zhuang Sui, a former vice chairman of the Standing Committee, said that China is going to stop putting so much money into U.S. dollars and will instead look to the Japanese yen and the euro. China holds more U.S. dollars than anyone else on the planet, but China is getting out of the U.S. dollar as fast as they can without crashing their own economy. Look at this chart. It shows that China's holdings of U.S. dollars peaked in 2009, but China is unloading as many dollars as they can as quickly as possible. This is just one sign of the end of the U.S. dollar standard. There are many more, like this one. As I'm sure you are aware, for years the U.S. dollar has been accepted almost universally around the globe. Heck, many times when I've traveled, I never even bothered to convert to the local currency because I knew everyone would take my dollars. Well, that's simply not the case anymore. HSBC, one of the largest banks in Mexico, no longer allows you to deposit U.S. dollars into their banks. They've done this on the heels of money laundering allegations, but we suspect they also simply don't want to be stuck with tons of U.S. dollars as the currency continues to decline. This move would have been unimaginable 10 years ago, that a big bank in Mexico would no longer accept U.S. dollars for deposit, but today it's the harsh reality and Mexico is not the only place this is occurring. Reuters reports that the same thing has happened in 2008 in one of Europe's most popular tourist spots. Currency exchange outlets in Amsterdam have been reportedly turning away customers who want to exchange their U.S. dollars for euros. In India, the country's tourism minister said in 2008 the U.S. dollars will no longer be accepted at the country's heritage tourist sites like the Taj Mahal. And the U.S. dollar is no longer good anywhere in Cuba. The New York Times reports that now many shops in China no longer accept dollar-based credit cards issued by foreign banks and foreigners cannot convert American dollars into renminbi beyond a given quota. Iran, of course, has already moved all of its reserves out of U.S. dollars and Kuwait depegged its currency from the dollar a few years ago. Bloomberg News recently reported that China and Russia plan to start trading in each other's currencies to diminish the dollar's role in global trade. Banu Bawaja of UBS Bank said, Given the risk to the dollar and U.S. assets from their fiscal position, they want to reduce their dependency on the dollar as an invoicing currency. That's why the smartest investors are taking action. Bill Gross, who probably knows as much about currencies and debt as anyone in the world, runs the world's biggest bond fund. He was quoted by Bloomberg. We've told all of our clients that if you only had one idea, one investment, it would be to buy an investment in a non-dollar currency. That should be on top of the list. Jim Rogers, one of the world's most successful multimillionaire investors, writes, the dollar is not just in decline, it's a mess. If something isn't done soon, I believe the dollar could lose its status as the world's reserve currency and medium of exchange, something that would lead to a huge decline in the standard of living for U.S. citizens, like nothing we've seen in nearly a century. I know, you probably still don't believe it can happen here in the United States, but think about it. Are we as Americans really immune to the laws of economics and finance? I don't think so. And every circumstance I know of in which a government has tried to inflate its debts away has ended in disaster. It will happen here too. As Jim Rogers says, history teaches us that such imprudent monetary and fiscal behavior has always led to economic disaster. This is why World Bank President Robert Zolick, in a speech at the School for Advanced International Studies at John Hopkins University, 
recently said, the United States would be mistaken to take for granted the dollar's place as the world's predominant reserve currency. Looking forward, there will increasingly be other options to the dollar. And this is why the International Monetary Fund recently published a paper calling for a new global world currency. A paper entitled, Reserve Accumulation and International Monetary Stability, written by the Strategy, Policy, and Review Department of the IMF, recommends that the world adopt a global currency called the Bancor, with a global central bank to administer the currency. The report is dated April 13, 2010. And no, unfortunately, this is not just a bad rumor. This is a deadly serious proposal and an official document from one of the most powerful institutions in the world. Do you see where this is all heading? This is why gold and silver prices are soaring. It's not a matter of if the U.S. dollar will lose its status as the world's reserve currency. It's simply a matter of when. Investors know there are serious, serious problems with the U.S. dollar, so they are fleeing to precious metals, which have historically been very reliable when a country has major currency problems. But first, let me explain why the collapse of the dollar as the world's reserve currency could happen much sooner than most people expect. I know many of my friends, colleagues, and family members are still in serious denial. In the world of psychology, they call this the normalcy bias. You see, the normalcy bias actually refers to our natural reactions when facing a crisis. The normalcy bias causes smart people to underestimate the possibility of a disaster and its effects. In short, people believe that since something has never happened before, it never will. We are all guilty of it. It's just human nature. The normalcy bias also makes people unable to deal with a disaster once it has occurred. Basically, people have a really hard time preparing for and dealing with something they have never experienced. The normalcy bias often results in unnecessary deaths and disaster situations. For example, think about the Jewish populations of World War II. As Barton Biggs reports in his book, Wealth, War, and Wisdom, by the end of 1935, 100,000 Jews had left Germany, but 450,000 still remained. Wealthy Jewish families kept thinking and hoping that the worst was over. Many of the German Jews brilliant, cultured, and cosmopolitan as they were, were too complacent. They had been in Germany so long and were so well established, they simply couldn't believe there was going to be a crisis that would endanger them. They were too comfortable. They believed that Nazis' anti-Semitism was an episodic event and that Hitler's bark was worse than his bite. They reacted sluggishly to the rise of Hitler for completely understandable but tragically erroneous reasons. Events moved much faster than they could imagine. This is one of the most tragic examples of the devastating effects of the normalcy bias the world has ever seen. Just think about what was going on at the time. Jews were arrested, beaten, taxed, robbed, and jailed for no reason other than the fact that they practiced a particular religion. As a result, they were shipped off to concentration camps. Their houses and businesses were seized. Yet most Jews still didn't leave Nazi Germany because they simply couldn't believe that things would get as bad as they did. That's the normalcy bias with devastating results. We saw the same thing happen during Hurricane Katrina. Even as it became clear that the Levy system was not going to work, tens of thousands of people stayed in their homes directly in the line of the oncoming waves of water. People had never seen things get this bad before, so they simply didn't believe it could happen. In Haiti, in Pakistan, in other third world countries, sure, but they never thought something like that could happen in our country. And as a result, nearly 2,000 residents died. Again, it's the normalcy bias. We simply refuse to see evidence that's right in front of our face because it is unlike anything we have experienced before. The normalcy bias kicks in, and we continue to go about our lives as if nothing is unusual or out of the ordinary. Well, we're seeing the same thing happen in the United States right now. We have been the world's most powerful country for nearly 100 years. The U.S. dollar has reigned supreme as the world's reserve currency for more than 50 years. Most of us in America simply cannot fathom these things changing. But I promise you this, things are changing, and faster than most people realize. For a moment, just look at a tiny fraction of the evidence around us. Did you know 
that there are now nearly 43 million Americans on food stamps. That's around 14% of the entire population. And get this, the number of Americans on food stamps has now gone up every month for 37 months. That's over three years. Can a country really be in good shape when 14% of the population can't even afford to buy food? Or how about this? Although it's gone almost completely unreported in the mainstream press, a dozen or so cities across the nation, like Fresno, Sacramento, and Nashville, have hundreds of people living in modern-day Depression-era shantytowns. The Fresno shantytown has received the most publicity after a visit by Oprah Winfrey. There, about 2,000 residents are homeless. They even have a security desk at the shelter because the encampment has gotten so large. City officials say they have three major encampments near downtown and smaller settlements along two local highways. Also, according to a recent article on MSN Money, about 43% of American families spend more than they earn each year. Look at this chart. It's unbelievable. The average household carries $8,000 in credit card debt, and personal bankruptcies have doubled in the past decade. How in the world can we possibly spend our way out of the current crisis? We certainly can't do it with savings. The only answer is to print more money, which will hasten the fall of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. There's simply no one better at bending statistics than the U.S. government. Take the unemployment rate, for example. Back in the 1930s, anyone without a job but not retired was considered unemployed. Today, however, the government calculates unemployment mainly by counting the number of people receiving unemployment benefits. So, when people's benefits expire, they are no longer counted, and the unemployment rate actually falls. Ridiculous, I know. The reality is, the true unemployment rate is much higher than what the government is reporting. If you don't believe me, look at two job postings I read about recently. In Long Island City, an estimated 2,000 people waited in line at the local employment office, some for as long as four days, to apply for 100 elevator mechanic apprenticeship positions. And in Massillon, Ohio, 700 people applied for a single janitorial job, paying $16 an hour plus benefits. The point is, our country is not growing jobs because the government makes it harder and harder for businesses. With current regulations in place, our country will never experience the type of growth necessary to dig our government out of the hole they put themselves in. I'm sure you think I'm exaggerating, but just look at what the CEO of one of America's most important companies said. Intel CEO Paul Attalini said in a recent speech, I can tell you definitively it costs $1 billion more per factory for me to build, equip, and operate a semiconductor manufacturing facility in the United States. He said that 90% of the additional costs are not from higher labor rates, but from higher taxes and regulatory charges, which other nations simply don't impose. Cypress Semiconductor CEO T.J. Rogers agreed that the problem is not higher U.S. wages, but anti-business laws. He was quoted in an interview with CNET News, the killer factor in California for a manufacturer to create, say, a thousand blue-collar jobs is a hostile government that doesn't want you there and demonstrates it in thousands of ways. Few Americans today realize that we have the second highest corporate tax rate in the world. And since Japan's new prime minister just announced that he plans to reduce the country's corporate tax rate by 15 percent, the U.S. could soon have the highest corporate tax rate in the world. Why would anyone want to start a business here when they can do it for less money and keep more of the money they make by locating elsewhere? It's just another good reason to avoid the U.S. dollar. The point is, the cards are seriously stacked against us. This looming currency crisis is inevitable. Almost every state in the country is on the verge of bankruptcy. We have borrowed an impossible amount of money, which we will never be able to pay back. Our economy is an absolute mess. Taxes are sky high already and will certainly go much higher over the next few years. And nearly all of the world's major financial players are preparing for an alternative to the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. To me, it is so obvious that we are about to experience a serious currency crisis that I can't believe people can deny this reality with a straight face. Again, if you don't believe a currency crisis is coming, 
Just take another look at the price of gold and silver compared to the U.S. dollar over the past decade. It's obvious that smart investors want to hold gold and silver, not U.S. dollars. Anyone with any sense or basic understanding of economics can tell the U.S. dollar is doomed, and it's going to have major repercussions, which the average American has not yet even considered. Here are the specific steps you should take. Step number one, get some of your money beyond the reach of the U.S. government. It's perfectly legal and a lot easier than you think. I know you probably don't believe me when I tell you that the U.S. government is going to implement policies to save itself, which are unimaginable right now. But remember, desperate governments will do very desperate things. That's why they outlawed the ownership of gold 80 years ago. That's why they are already talking about nationalizing automatic 401k and retirement plans, and why it might soon be against the law to open a foreign bank account or to move your money overseas without paying outrageous taxes. Step number two, how to acquire the world's safest assets, which are likely to perform best during this period. What I'm talking about here is buying as much gold and silver as you can reasonably afford. I know, gold has had a huge run, jumping more than 400% in the past decade. But believe me, when the U.S. dollar loses its status as the world's reserve currency, this early run is going to be a mere afterthought. I will be surprised if gold does not reach $5,000 or $6,000 an ounce in the next few years. The smartest money managers in the world, people like George Soros, David Einhorn, and John Paulson, have all recently taken huge positions in gold. And I think you are crazy not to do the same. And what about silver? Well, I believe silver will serve a unique role during this currency crisis. Let me explain. For most of recorded history, the price of gold has been around 16 times the price of silver. This ratio, the so-called silver ratio, has fluctuated from time to time based on silver discoveries and attempts by governments to regulate the silver to gold ratio. But in a free market where demand for silver as money exists, I'd expect the natural supply and demand balance to lead to a silver price around 1 16th the price of gold. Based on the historical ratio with the price of gold around $1,500, the price of silver should be over 90. It's not, of course. Today, silver is trading around $34. Today, then, gold is selling for more than 44 times the price of silver. What explains the difference between hundreds of years of history and today? Why is silver still so cheap relative to gold? When silver is demonetized, as it is now, meaning it's not being used for money, but just for industrial purposes, supplies soar as people sell silver for gold and other currencies. On the other hand, during periods of monetary crisis, demand for silver as money pushes the silver ratio heavily in silver's favor. For example, the ratio returned to its historic range during World War I. It happened again in the early 1970s when Nixon abandoned the gold standard. It also happened most famously in 1979-1980 when it seemed as if America was really entering a serious money crisis. Most people don't know this, but silver is actually the best performing asset of this century, not gold. As my multimillionaire friend and currency expert Chris Weber pointed out, gold has risen from $256 to $1,500 since 2001. That is a rise of over 500%. Silver has risen from $4.02 to $34. That is a rise of 845%. In short, silver is the best hedge against a money crisis. As the dollar fails, silver will once again be in demand as money. And as this demand materializes, the free market price of silver will likely return to around 1 16th the price of gold. When gold hits $2,000 an ounce, assuming the price of gold is 16 times the price of silver, silver should be worth about $125 per ounce. And my friend Chris Weber believes silver will likely hit $187 an ounce. If that happens, you could make gains of around 450% if you invest at today's prices. Remember, the government is not going to save you. You can either let things happen to you, or you can take a few simple steps and take charge of your family's fate. 